Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy is sponsored by Thomson Reuters, providing legal professionals with the intelligence, technology, and human expertise they need to find trusted answers. Products include Westlaw, Practical Law, and Firm Central legal practice management software for small law firms. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Online at ThomsonReuters.com. Access to Democracy is made possible in part by a donation from Firefly Credit Union. Firefly is the new name of U.S. Federal Credit Union, which has proudly served the financial needs of the Greater Twin Cities community since 1925. At Firefly, we guide our members forward and give them the power to chase dreams by delivering the financial solutions they need to get ahead. From checking accounts to mortgages, we'll light the way. We are Firefly Credit Union, and this is Life Illuminated and Dr. Charles Crutchfield of award-winning Crutchfield Dermatology in Egan, acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. A Minnesota native who trained at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Crutchfield personally treats all patients and states that experience counts and quality matters. Crutchfield Dermatology, look good, feel great, with beautiful skin. Welcome. Access to Democracy Returns. Alan Miller here with a return guest. It's been a while since he's been here. Ken Martin, the chair of the Minnesota DFL, recently reelected to his fourth term Correct. Uh, in the chair. And you also have several other uh, kudos that you can talk about in terms of uh, elections to positions that you hold. So tell us about Well, them. just recently, uh, shortly before I was re-elected as chair of the DFL, I was elected by my peers around the country, fellow state party chairs, vice chairs, and others, uh, and Democratic National Committee members, to serve as the chair of the chairs, as the president of the Association of State Democratic Chairs, which makes me a vice chair of the uh, Democratic National Committee. And I'm pleased to be able to work alongside Chairman Perez and Deputy Chair Keith Ellison now as we uh, work to rebuild the Democratic Party after these devastating losses of 2016. Devastating losses, even losing control here in Minnesota, and yet uh, we still have the four constitutional offices here. And we re-elected our Congress people. Of course, there was a vacancy uh, in terms of the Klein a position which went to Jason Lewis mm -hmm. beyond my comprehension with everything that Angie Craig brought to right. the to the race but be that as it may but where do we go from here how well, do we go from here well and first off let me say while certainly the loss uh, here in Minnesota uh, was um, pretty dramatic. Uh, it wasn't as deep. The hole is not as deep here in Minnesota as it is in other parts of the country. As you mentioned, uh, we kept all of our congressional seats in rural uh, parts of this state. Uh, there are now only 10 rural congressional seats held by Democrats in the whole country, three of them here in Minnesota. Uh, and so thankfully Congressman Nolan, Congressman Peterson, and Congressman Walls were reelected. In addition, um, we, uh, as you mentioned, hold all of our constitutional offices and statewide offices, both U.S. Senators, five of the eight congressional seats. And we only lost the state Senate majority by a very slim margin. So one vote one, really one, differential. Uh, one, one seat uh, margin here. So when you start to think about the path forward for the DFL here in Minnesota, we start from uh, a relatively strong position as we head into 2018. That's not to suggest that it will be an easy task, but I do think that uh, we should all uh, count our lucky stars uh, through a lot of hard work that we are in a much more fortunate position than other states. You know, that said, there were clearly some losses that uh, uh, were really stinging. You mentioned CD2, my own home 
uh, congressional district as as yours. We had a fantastic candidate in Angie Craig who ran uh, one of the best congressional campaigns I've ever seen. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she was a victim of uh, this Trump wave. Uh, we also uh, had a great candidate in CD3 and Terry Bonoff running against Eric Paulson. So, you know, the reality is, is um, in, in elections, there's things you can control. And of the things we can, uh, could control last year, uh, we did a fairly decent job. Although in every election, there's always things you can learn what and do better. What we couldn't control was the Russians. Yeah. What we couldn't control was their participation, which is now first coming to light, which puts somebody I in the White House who I believe is mentally unstable and not fit to hold that office, uh, which I've written about quite a bit. There's no doubt that uh, there were <coughs> external factors that ended up influencing the election at the end of the day. Uh, the Russian influence, the Comey investigation, some other pieces that broke late that actually uh, uh, did uh, change uh, voting behavior. But let me just say this, because I think it's important after every election that we look in the mirror. And the reality is, is like it or not, our candidate's message did not resonate with voters. We saw a mass exodus of Democratic voters, particularly working class voters, away from the Democratic Party this year. And Alan, you know this, in the 30s and the 40s under FDR, under the New Deal, with the New Deal programs, the base of the Democratic Party was built. Working class people, what I call lunch pail Democrats, people would go, who would go out and work with their hands, believed passionately that their economic futures were tied to the Democratic Party. And for years, they voted with Democrats. And they felt left out this time. They did time. feel left out. And that's, that's the key. They felt left out. And I'll <laughs> tell you, you know, uh, we saw a huge swing away from uh, us with working class voters. And we also saw a huge swing away from us with voters in rural parts of this state and rural parts of this country. Now, I have no doubt that every racist and sexist in this country supported Trump. But it would be a very big mistake for us to suggest that every Trump supporter is a racist and a sexist. Let me give you an example. Here in Minnesota, 19 counties that voted for President Obama in 2008 and 2012 flipped and voted for, for Trump. Trump. So to suggest that those people are racist is just not accurate. What I would argue is that... Disillusioned. Well, what I would argue is that people felt left out. And I'll give you an example. My father-in-law is a farmer in southern Minnesota. 800 acres of corn and beans and beef cattle. Salted the earth guy. Not a racist bone or a sexist bone in his body. But he voted for Trump. And I asked him, Dave, why did you vote for Trump? He said, because Donald Trump was speaking to me. I said, what do you mean? I don't recall him ever talking about farm policy or egg policy. He goes, you don't, you're not listening to me. He was speaking to me. And uh, as we went along in the conversation, it started to make sense to me what he's talking about. Here, my father-in-law's family has farmed that land for 130 years. All of his kids, my wife included, live up here in the cities. None of them want to go back and farm. His wife has Parkinson's disease. And his health care premiums tripled to $2,000 a month. So for Dave, he's got this knot of anxiety about his future in his stomach. And here was our message. Unfortunately, our message was stop Trump. His message, as offensive as it is to me as a Democrat, was make America great again. Now, I know what he really meant. But the reality is, is of those two messages, for someone with some economic anxiety about his own future, it was clear which one of those two messages appealed to him. And that's a great analogy as to what happened across the country. Well, it, exactly. And, you know, <coughs> Alan, four years ago, I, uh, in, in five years ago now, in 2012, I was fortunate enough to be one of the founding board members of the Minnesotans United for All Families campaign. And during that campaign, I sat down with uh, Governor Wendy Anderson. Uh, and I asked Wendy, how do you think the issue of gay marriage is going to play in greater Minnesota? And he said, Ken, let me tell you something. People in greater Minnesota are good people. They don't mind if you stand up and fight for gay rights or for communities of color or immigrants as long as they feel like you're standing up and fighting for them as well. Now, if they feel like you forgot them, they're going to leave you. Now, it's not completely analogous to this election, but I would say what you said earlier 
is a big part of the reason we lost so many voters this year. People didn't feel like the Democratic Party or the DFL was standing up and fighting for them as well. And they want somebody to speak for them. They want somebody yes. to point things up. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And I was one who saw it. Well, when Trump first announced, I said, four months, he's going to be gone. As the campaign progressed, I said, this guy's going to win. And this is really scary. And well, he did win, and it is scary. And uh, we've got quite a mess. But there are a lot of people that I see that are having buyer's remorse. Yes. I just read an article today about school district in one of the most conservative districts in Colorado. Just elected four out of six progressives mm. uh, in that school district. There's a district down, a very red district, a very Republican district in Georgia where the Democratic candidate is at the moment running ahead. In fact, yes, Georgia the, re the Republicans just diverted a ton of money into that district. Correct. Uh, that's people speaking out. In the Texas legislature yesterday, uh, a question came up about Bessie, Betsy DeVos's uh, concept of education, where she wants to privatize it in effect, and it went down 103 to 40. Yeah. So, and that's in a very GOP controlled legislature. Right. So I think people are waking up. Well, we're seeing, and we have to continue that, we're seeing and they're it all, also frightened. We're seeing it all over the place right now, not just within the party where we're seeing uh, the ranks of our party membership just uh, surging right now. People coming out of the woodwork and joining and, and rolling up their sleeves. But with all of these organic groups out there right now that have popped up since the election, groups like Our Revolution, Indivisible, Stand Up Minnesota, and others that are giving an outlet to people who are frustrated. And it's not just Democrats. It, these are people people from all parts of our community, uh, people who are Republicans, independents, Greens, uh, nonpartisan uh, people who are frustrated with the direction of our country now under Donald Trump, feeling that the, the direction he's leading us down is not only dangerous, but it's completely anathema to our values. Now, the danger I would suggest uh, for all of us is to not develop uh, the same sort of mindset that developed before the last election, which Absolutely. there was a certain sense of inevitability <coughs> that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election. And we cannot... Started with Hillary, Well, sure. And we cannot, Alan, believe that just because the Republicans are imploding, that somehow we're going to win elections. And what I mean by that, I have no doubt right now that the pendulum will swing back our way. But if we're not organized, truly organized from the grassroots with a alternative message of our own about what we're going to do as Democrats to improve people's lives, we won't be able to catch that pendulum as it swings back. You see, the key, I believe, is to focus less on Donald Trump and to focus more on what we can do to make a difference for people's lives. If we do that, I think we're going to be able to capture the hearts and minds of, of all of these people who, who, who are feeling uh, buyer's remorse for well, voting for Trump. We've got to get that message out. Yes. And that really is important, uh, just what you say. I, I think that people related to Bernie Sanders for the same reason. Uh, they could understand Bernie. They heard what he said, and they liked what he said. I have no doubt that had he been the candidate, he would have beaten Trump. Well, you know, we'll, we'll never know, so it's an <laughs> academic argument. But the one thing I can say is the one thing Bernie had right is his message. He understood the economic anxiety and the angst that people were feeling in this country. And, uh, and he had a track record of, of four sure, decades of sure, saying the of same course, thing. Of course. But I think at the end of the day, we'll never know for sure uh, what would have happened in that election. But we do know that uh, 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 Bernie's economic populist message was a message that would have resonated with people's uh, economic anxiety that they were uh, having in this country. And that's something we need to understand as Democrats, that we need to stand up and fight for people in all parts of our uh, uh, communities, our state, our country. And we need to be very specific about ways that we can address economic anxiety. Healthcare, we should be pushing for single payer. 
uh, education. I just we had should that be conversation with a Republican senator who sure. was here earlier today. And uh, he doesn't quite agree with me, but he's much more reasonable than most of his peers. Uh, but absolutely, education. Yep. Uh, we have a woman in there who's completely inept. Right. Uh, who would do away with public education. Well, I don't know. I'm a product of public education. Maybe they don't brag about that, but uh, well, the but fact of the matter is that... Uh, yeah, I, I mean, look, what, what's driving people's economic anxiety? First thing is their jobs. So we need to make sure that we, when we're talking about trade deals and, and other uh, pieces, we need to make sure that we put America first and we keep jobs here in this country and we don't enter into any bad trade deals that are going to cost us jobs. Two, education. People shouldn't have to worry about their kids taking out a mortgage, essentially, to go to school and go to college. We should find a way to make sure that uh, every high school graduate from a high school here in Minnesota gets a free college tuition. Third is health care. It's not just their own health care, no but it's also elder care. So many people are having to take care of their parents now, and we have to figure out a way both with health care and elder care to address that. We can do a lot of that through going to a single payer and getting a profit margin out of both of those <laughs> arenas. So that is stuff that drives anxiety, and we need Next, to be fighting on that side. I would say environment. Well, of course. That's, that's the fourth leg of the chair that uh, I have been pushing because it's so important, and we're not going to get that from anybody in this administration. Right. And we've got an attorney general who is turning back the clock on civil rights and individual rights and voting rights. Uh, I can't think of a worse choice for attorney general. Uh, so that we, we have got to rally around these points mm -hmm. and drive that message home. Yes. Now, with, with somebody like Keith Ellison as vice chair, yeah. it's the message that he projects. Yeah. Can we project it really well, look, nationwide? I, we can, and I was a big supporter of Keith, and uh, still am. He's a great friend and, and someone that I have a 17-year uh, relationship of working alongside in, in electoral politics. Uh, Keith understands that the way that you build political power is from the grassroots. And his motto in his campaign, as you know, is everybody counts and everybody matters. And I believe that's the approach we have to take as a Democratic Party as we seek to, to rebuild from the ashes of this last election. We have to approach every voter throughout this country with a positive uh, message about what our vision is and how we can uh, improve their lives. But we also need to organize everywhere, not leave any uh, stone unturned, now, organize from the grassroots, knock on every door and talk to as uh, many voters as we can to get them engaged in our democracy. That's the way we're going to win again. And I'm excited sort about of, working with sort Keith Sort of on the this. Jim Carlson policy right here, who ran his best race ever in a year that was a disastrous year. So why does, why does that happen? Because he does just that. Yep. He knocks on every door. He answers every letter. He answers every email. He responds to every phone call. And he gets the message across. And it's certainly something we have to do. Now, here in Minnesota, uh, where we're going to have more people running for governor on the Democratic ticket, uh, than I could ever imagine, and, and they're still coming out of the woodwork. Why, why aren't you running, Alan? You might as well. Everyone else is. <laughs> so, well, look, you know, I, I feel blessed. Uh, of all, uh, We've got so many good candidates running for governor. Mm -hmm. We expect a few more here in the coming months. And, uh, you know, the key when you have all of these good candidates in the field is to make sure that we don't do the work of the Republicans for them. And what I mean by that is that we're not beating each other up. We're not uh, doing all the negatives against so each other. Other. essential. Yeah, it, if we can keep it above the board, we have a good positive issue-based campaign focused on the future, focused on the differences between us and the Republicans instead of the differences between uh, uh, Democrats. I think we'll be in well, a position at, to win. Look at the candidates, and the candidates should be saying, elect me because this is what I stand for, and this is what I have done, and check my track record. Uh, Without absolutely, without this inter-party death, death knell that we've had in the past with some races. Yeah. 
you know, primaries don't have to be a bad thing. They can be a good thing. It's, but it's all in how our candidates decide to um, uh, use that platform. And my hope is that uh, people will always remember, all of these candidates and their supporters will remember that there's more that ties us together as Democrats than separates us. While there may be some minor differences between the candidates, that we're all on the same team. And the most important thing, and I hope every one of your viewers and, and everyone else who will be participating in the next two years keeps this in mind. We are one race away from being just like Wisconsin. This is an existential moment for the DFL. If we lose the governor's race and they keep control of the House, they'll have control of all three levers of government here in Minnesota. And there's no doubt at that point that of what we will face. And all the... You'll face the Middle Ages is what you'll face. We'll, we will face it, and we'll probably be even uh, more severe than what we've seen in Wisconsin. And all these things that we care about and have fought hard for over the years in Minnesota will evaporate overnight. We have got to make we that our We see it happening on a national level. We see it with the appointments that have been made uh, by Trump so far or uh, whoever is advising Trump this week, <clears throat> we don't know. But uh, you're absolutely right about that. And, uh, but there are good signs. Now, there have been caucuses in both Minneapolis and St. Paul this week. Uh, talk about the turnout. Talk well, about the what's turnout, going on The there. turnout at the Minneapolis caucuses uh, on, on Tuesday night was uh, exceptional. I think it doubled the last uh, time uh, we had caucuses there four years ago. And there's a lot of great energy right now uh, in all of the wards. Uh, there's a lot of uh, fantastic races going on uh, for mayor and for uh, c city council as well as for, for the uh, park board. And we're just seeing people who've never been engaged before uh, getting involved. And part of what's driving that certainly are the races. But another piece that's driving that is a sense of people who've never been engaged before that what's happening in Washington right now necessitates new blood, new energy, new ideas, and their involvement. And so as a political leader, as I watch this, I'm really buoyed by and excited by all these people coming out of the woodwork. And if that continues, which, which as I've talked to my colleagues in other states, they're, they're seeing exactly the same thing. Their ranks of their party are growing. People are coming out. People are getting involved. They are. And when they get involved, good things happen. Correct. And we have to really encourage them to get involved. And we have to encourage them to campaign on the things that we really stand for and not an anti-campaign as you mentioned early which was a big mistake and uh, it was it was a big mistake and i'll tell you i mean angie craig and i have talked about this a little <coughs> bit too i mean i think at the end of the day uh some of her consultants and others uh, fell into that same trap where it became a campaign ag against jason lewis and you know i believe angie and i, I hope she does I, I think she will run again and i believe she'll win she ran a great campaign. But the problem when you just run against someone and what they stand for is people don't know what you stand for. And we have to remind people of that. We need to remind people that we are the party out there fighting for them. And if we do that, I think we'll be successful. And it has to be a ground swell. Yes. And it has to be from the ground up. Yes. And um, I had a very difficult time getting Angie on this show. Well, this is just one show, but the track record of this show is it has been tremendously successful to people who are candidates, but the people who are running her campaign were really Washington-oriented people. And I, I, I said early on, this is a mistake. We had her on once for 15 minutes. Mm. That is not how you win an election. What you do is people get out there they look at our website, they look at YouTube, they s watch the programs locally, Right. but it's the website and it's the YouTube that generates people contacting, contacting us from other areas. Uh, 
And you've got to relate to those people. You've yeah. got to get with those people. Yeah, and yeah it, you know, I, I think that is the key as we move forward on all of this is, you know, we need to get outside of our comfort zone, have conversations with, with as many people as we can about what's happening in this country, remind them of the stakes, uh, and, and remind them that the beauty of a democracy. Now, the question is whether or not there will be a democracy in two years with this crazy guy in the White House. I assume there will be, but you never know. But assuming It's going to be a lot to rebuild. Assuming there's a democracy in two years, that means there will be an election. And in an election, the beauty of electoral politics is we can start to take power back. So if you don't like what Donald Trump's doing, you have the ability at the ballot box to make a change. Now, unfortunately, we can't get rid of him until 2020, but we Unless can. Unless he's impeached. <laughs> but, as you know, Alan, look, imagine if we could take back one of the chambers in 2018. And the Senate is not out of reach. The Senate, I would say neither one are out of reach. You know, in 2006, we saw a wave election for Democrats where we took back control of both the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate by pretty wide margins. You could see a similar situation happening. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that it will happen. Elections, um, uh, there's no certainty or guarantee in elections. And that's the one thing I want to caution people on. Despite how unpopular Donald Trump and the Republicans are right now, we cannot assume that they're going to lose in 2018. And we have to protect ourselves from the falsehoods. We have to have an apparatus ready to go to refute alternative facts. Right. I never heard of alternative <laughs> facts before uh, a few months ago. Right. But alternative facts which are blatant lies there there are facts these are them right we have to sell infrastructure we have to sell education we have to sell well, particularly college for all mm -hmm. health care which has now fallen on its face twice with the republicans because they blabbed for uh six seven years and never had a plan in mind yep. and we've actually not even scratch the surface here of what I wanted to talk to you about and we're down to a minute. So let's give some conclusions to the people who are watching in and tell them where and how they can get involved. Well I think the most important thing is not to give up, not to despair. If you're feeling frustrated right now with what's going on in this country to get involved, to roll up your sleeves and find uh, your local DFL chapter, your local stand-up chapter, Indivisible, Our Revolution. There's groups out there right now that are making sure that we collectively raise everyone's voices, stand up and resist Donald Trump and the Republicans. And then at some point, we need to turn all of that action into tangible work on the doors, talking to voters and engaging them in this upcoming election so that we actually take power back from Donald Trump. So this is the opportunity. I, I would uh, encourage everyone to visit www.dfl.org to get involved. There's ways to do that, uh, or visit your local uh, DFL meeting. It's Ken really Martin, important. Minnesota DFL. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Let's as go always. forward. Yep. <laughs>